I'm glad you're here. In today's episode, I'm talking to Richard Franklin, and I joke that Richard is an equal opportunity offender. What I mean by that is he'll call anyone out for anything. On the flip side of that, he's no respecter of persons, and he has a unique ability to see people from the heart. We talk about Richard's very important work in the Dell Valley School District, which is just southeast of Austin. I have really appreciated what I've learned from Richard over the years, his unique perspective and his unwavering commitment to tell the truth. So I hope that you will appreciate it as well. And thank you for joining today. Hello and welcome to The Deepening Place. I'm very happy today to have my friend Richard Franklin joining. Richard is a community activist and a mentor and founder of Youth Unlimited. Richard, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Good. I woke Can, up. You woke up. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the work of Youth Unlimited? Uh, yes. About 15 years ago, I had an epiphany mm-hmm. sitting in a church one day, and I was thinking to myself about the, the children that were uh, in, in special need out there, and I, I think they all are at some point in time. And it came to mind that I, I myself had been a special need kid, and I, I, I began to relate some of the stories I had with some of the kids around me and realized that's what I've been doing all my life was actually talking to people, about, you know, young people, about uh, trying to get their lives uh, in order, trying to make them understand what was going on and, and to give it some sense of, of reality for them. And the reality is, as children, a lot of times we just, it doesn't make sense to us. So I was trying to make sense of it based on my own experiences. And for the last 15 years, I've been talking to the kids who are both misunderstood and misunderstanding uh, what's going on. And that's, that's basically what it, what it came out of. And I, it's been very successful in helping okay. kids who would have been falling, who would have fallen by the wayside. So you just were thinking about these kids, but instead of thinking about it, like from the adult perspective, you allowed yourself to remember how you felt and how, what you were going through. And then that kind of birthed this thing where you can really relate to the kids on their level. Yeah. I think, I, I I think more than anything else, we as adults forget what it was like to be a kid. Yeah. And I've always been a kid. I I never moved that, that far away from it. I, I feel like I'm kind of that bridge sometimes between the adult mm-hmm. world and, and the kid world, but especially for the from the kid's standpoint, they need someone to, a lot of times, just be on their side. That, that more so than anything else is just someone listen to what I'm saying and feel what I'm feeling right now. And I think a lot of times we as as young adults, as we as we make that transition, are looking for somebody to just make sense of all of all the things that are happening to us at that time, and that's that's where it comes from. I think adults fall into the trap, too, of, of managing kids instead of helping to preserve their dignity. I think parents fall in this trap, too, and teachers. Like, you just start managing, and you forget that they're a human with a unique perspective. Right. And, and, it and feels you're going like, through things that, we don't, that we're not aware of. You know, yeah. The kid that's at school that's, that's being bullied doesn't know how to handle it. The kid that's, be, that's bullying someone else and, and themselves, they're being bullied somewhere else. They don't, they can't make sense of it. The kid who's going through, you know, transitions in their lives and, and, and they don't know how to handle it, then who do they talk to about it? Because the adult is trying to get them to grow up a lot of times before, before it's their turn or it's their time. So you got the frontal lobe actually being developed at a time that is not ready. And you're trying to force them into situations that they're not ready to handle. And I said, a lot of times I'm dealing with kids who are handling situations that even the adults I know would crumble. If they were going through this stuff, I've, I've dealt with kids who are part of this domestic violence process that happens in one out of every three households in our, in our nation right now. They're bringing that trauma to, to, to school with them every day. I'm dealing with kids who are dealing, dealing with situations in the streets. They're bring, bringing that trauma to school with them every day. I'm dealing with kids who are dealing with the st- stuff that's in, in the, the cliquish process at school. You remember the popular kids 
and the unpopular kids, the kids who fit into each one of those groups, and then the kids who didn't fit in any group. All those kids invited in. And the funniest part is when you see them all in at the same time and we start having conversations. And it was it, was, it was, last year was really an awakening because I, I have some of the really rough neck kids who think they're really rough neck. But then I have a group of nerdish kids. And the rough neck kids start listening to stories from the from the nerdish kids and went, Oh my God, you guys are more screwed up than us. And they literally said that. You guys oh. are more screwed up than us. So they know they're screwed up. That's the funny part. Yeah. They know that they're screwed up. They don't know that the other kids are screwed up. They think mm-hmm. other kids are okay. And the reality is very few of them are okay. I talk about at-risk kids. I said, you know, what you fail to understand is they're all at risk. If we don't get them and, 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 and give them some semblance of dignity, they're all at risk. And they're at risk to our own society, to our own civilization, because they're the next wave. And I'm trying to get a kid to understand, I need you to find your talent. I need you to find out what it is you do well, do it maxed out, and then give it back to the world so that both we and you benefit from it. That's what we're working. That's how we're working. Yes. Yeah. I think that's, you know, the whole bottom line. What we're made for is to be about life, to create life, use our life to create life. And that's kind of what you're saying to these kids. You need to get out there and and create and expand and be everything that you can be. Right. Be the best you that you can be. And sometimes yeah. it also means being around other people that are not like you and bouncing off their talent, banking off of their talent sometimes makes you a better person. But you've got to be willing to listen to them, be part of their lives and let them be part of your life. And it is really sad when you talk to some, especially the young men, who are out here trying to fit into some false narrative that's been created outside of themselves and they're trying to live up to it. I always talk about I said, though, that, that gang mindset that someone said is, is, is prevalent in our community. I said, that's not, that's, that's a reality we've been living for years uh, as a society because what we're as Robert Bly talks about it. Young men, uh, gangs are, are, are young men trying to initiate themselves into manhood. And the reality is if they're not men around them who, who can validate their manhood, who can tell them, by the way, son, what you're doing right now, that's not a man thing. That's something that's created somewhere else. That really isn't a man piece, what you're doing right there. And I've had kids in my program. I, I, I wear a suit and uh, I wear a suit jacket and or a tie at all times around my kids. They never see me in, in sportswear. They always see me in wait, a suit jacket. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> that surprises me, Richard, because I've only ever seen you in bizarre in sports t-shirts. Wear. Exactly. Yeah, crazy will, t-shirts. You have no idea how, how often I like to wear those crazy t-shirts around. They have no idea how, wanna, I'm, how badly I want to take my t-shirts and wear them around them. So as I said, this that this, is so funny to me. Out. Every time I see right. a really crazy t-shirt, right. I'm like, I need to buy that for Richard. Right, right, I mean, right. To hear that you're wearing your suit and tie. Yes, it's it's. But I it love is, that. You're sh- it's the transition, yeah. right? It is. It literally is the my life as the dichotomy of my life. The reality is, when I'm around kids, I'm trying to give them the most professional person they can imagine. But every once in a while, I have to break it down to them in terms they understand. And it gets rough. We have some rough conversations sometimes. I say, but you understand, I'm going where the child is and then taking them where I'd like to at least lead them in a a direction so they can get out of that. But what happens is I'm around kids and I'm wearing a suit jacket and a tie. And it happened a couple of years ago. One of the guys said, look at the way you guys dress. But uh, well, I ain't going to dress like no punk. Now I'm sitting here in the suit jacket and the tie. <laughs> and you just said, I'm dressed yeah. punk. And I walked at him like I was about to rip his head off. I'm, he said, no, 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 Mr. Franklin, not you. So wait a minute. So let me see if I'm understanding this. I'm not a punk because you know me. Uh, if you didn't know me, I'd be a punk because I'm wearing this kind of clothing. So you've already judged me coming in the doors if you know who I am based on my clothing. Let's talk about that for a second. So that led, led into a whole conversation about dressing for success, dressing to impress, and who are you trying to impress with the way you dress? And that's also interesting. I said, because here's the issue at the end of the day. I see some of you guys out here who have really ugly behinds, but you've shown them to me. I'm like, dude, at the end of the day, I'm not hiring you because I saw you last week and you got an ugly ass. And he looked so funny. I said, bro, I'll just let you know, bro. So yeah. also understand it's not just the, your friends who you think you're impressing. 
It's the rest of the world that sees you every day. And if you don't understand that, then what you need to do is understand it starting now. If you want to impress your friends, ask yourself a serious question. Is your friend the one who's going to be paying the bills? Is your friend the one who you're going to get a loan from? Is your friend the one who's going to help you get through life? And if so, that's cool. I'm not saying, I'm not saying it isn't. But I'm saying at the end of the day, you better recognize other people are going to judge you, whether you like it or not. And, and we've had this conversation about being judged and if it's important whether people like you or not. So when you come in to try to get that bank loan to start that business you want to start, is it important that the bank that the banker like you? Oh, oh, it changes the conversation now, don't it? And that's the and that's the way we make them understand. One thing that I love about you is that you are an equal opportunity offender. Oh yeah, <laughs> you will call out you'll call out anybody. So those poor kids with their baggy pants, they're gonna get it just like everybody else is gonna. Oh get yeah, it, I, so. I I think I I think it's necessary for us to be true to ourselves at the end of the day, you know, and yeah. I. I have a problem. I, I'm telling people all the time. I said, I I ran for office one time as a Democrat. I said, but I've never been a Democrat. You know, I don't. I, don't, I believe in policies. I don't believe in, in parties. I don't believe in politics that way. I just don't see it. So you know, I, I I ran based on the fact that where I am to get to office, Democrats run the show. So I ran as a Democrat. But I would never. I'm not a Democrat. I believe in people. For you, when it comes to an election, you kind of size up and you just take what you consider to be your best bet at each each time. Well, no, because I hate them all. But that's at the end of the day. Well, I know you hate them all, but I mean, I know you're going to vote. You... I'm looking for that none of the above button. We need to put that button on there right now. You know, oh, OK. Because so... you, you have these you have these 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 binary choices of two evils. Then what you're saying is, you know, they're, they're evil. You've given me evil as a choice. Now, where in life does someone say you can have this this set of poison or this set of poison? Which one would you like? Which what, which one's going to kill you? The one that's going to kill you right away or the one's going to kill you slowly? Which one would you like to have? And I'm saying I don't want poison in my life at all. I don't want a, a binary choice of bad and, and worse. That's sometimes unacceptable. And we as we as, as a civilization should stop accepting those who give us terrible choices. But for some reason, we have allowed ourselves to be propagandized into believing because someone has an R or D behind their name, it's okay. And I, I'm looking at what's happening to people. I'm looking at what's happening to, to right, right. I'm looking at what's happening to our society. And when someone says there's a, a massive amount of wealth at the top and a great deal of poverty at the bottom and the middle was trying to hold this nonsense together, then that's a crazy concept. That's a great, that doesn't make any sense to me. And I, I said, why do we have, and you have to ask yourself a question. Why do we, why do we have a minimum wage, but not a maximum wage? How obscene is it for someone to be worth over a hundred billion dollars when I have an entire community that's, that's literally about to be thrown out of their homes. And the sad part is we live in a Judeo-Christian society that doesn't speak to the fact that all you've done is build more silos. That ain't the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. And, you know, we admire people like Amazon, Jeff yeah, Bezos. Right. And not not only is he capable of solving lots of problems, but he's also running small businesses out. And we are conditioned to believe that that's OK because he's winning. Right. Right. He has the money and we have worshipped the money. We're worshipping, again, the value system told us those who have stuff have value. And I keep saying, but here, at the end of the day, what about your grandmother who took care of you? Does she have value? Does she have more value in your life than Jeff Bezos? Then why don't we start realigning the fact that the people who take care of us, the people, I mean, I would have thought this pandemic situation would have changed the way we looked at everything, but it didn't. Yeah, because it instantly got propagandized away from real Worse life. than ever, right? Right. We, we, they made more money during the pandemic than they did before. Because we instantly glommed on to them. The people who were in Congress instantly glommed on to giving them more money and thought, that, well, they're going to save us. And that's not the way it works. We save us. We the people. Yeah. If we only realized how much power we had if we joined together. Well, that's the and, end of the day, though. We've been taught to fight against each other. That's how, how it yeah. happened. And that's what you know. a lot of this current stuff is about. If we really opened our eyes to see that 
our food is poisoned and Flint, Michigan's water still sucks. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. we could really go after the people that were making life miserable, but instead we're fighting each other. We've been conditioned to do that. Now, that's what I'm trying to get these kids that I deal with every day to understand. You've been conditioned to believe what you believe. And I and I, I actually have a session on when do you start believing what you believe? And the kids look at me all funny. I said, I just I don't care what it is you believe. But when did you start believing it? Because you didn't come out of the womb thinking that way. Yeah. Someone had to tell you to think the way you think. Someone had to make you believe what you believe. And you have to ask yourself, when did you have the first cognizant thought that started making you who you are today? When did that happen? Were you three years old? Can you remember when you were three years old? What what was the first thing you what first thing you remembered in your life that you can still go back to and say that's what when things start happening for me? Just think about it. Was the time you're out there playing in the street and your mother said, get out of the street, you're gonna hit by get hit by a car, and now you realize the cars are dangerous if they run you over? Let's let's talk about how we get conditioned to think certain things. I said, you sit and watch that television. And a lot of times your parents were putting you in front of the television as part of your babysitting. You've never considered the fact that every time they put on a cartoon, the cartoon makes you think about things a certain way. So we got to start understanding how we're conditioned to do and think certain things and have to uncondition ourselves, recondition ourselves to get to a different place to think differently about everything. And I, I used to own a nightclub in San Antonio. I said, we had what, quote unquote, the stars come through there every night. You know, Michael Jordan came through and Beverly Johnson came through and Carl Lewis came through and all these and, I, and all the and NBA ball players. In fact, they hung out there. And I said it was funny because the night Michael Jordan came through, everybody was losing their minds. And I said, why are y'all losing your stuff over Michael Jordan? Can Has Michael Jordan cured cancer? Did Michael Jordan save a life today that I don't know about? Michael Jordan has a, a skill set about shooting basketballs. Why do you think that makes him any more valuable than the cook who just cooked me a great meal, a phenomenal meal? Why do you think that kid that's back in the back who can clean up the garbage pails better than anybody else isn't just as valuable as Michael Jordan? See, my problem is not understanding that you've you've elevated certain things to a certain place in your in your life because that's what they told you was valuable. And I think it's wonderful that you can jump 44, 45 inches in the air. Great. But can you get in a science lab and and cure Alzheimer's for me? No. Yeah, I think uh, what you're saying is something I've been thinking a lot about right now. I think some of the current solutions are tearing people down. And it's not that Michael Jordan is not special and fantastic. We don't need to tear him down, but so is everybody else. And how can we celebrate everybody's life Right. and give everybody a living wage? Exactly. How do I find how do I find the special in your life? How do I make that yeah. something that stands out? And there's a, a movie called Quinceanera. And there's an old guy in the movie that I think he was gay when he was young. And it was, he winds up being the old uncle in the community. He makes everybody a meal and all this other stuff. But then he passes everybody. The whole community comes to his funeral. And you realize how many lives he touched. And that's important. When someone touches that many lives, you don't even realize what they've done. When you said that, it reminded me of love your neighbor as yourself. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then to love your neighbor as yourself. To me, what you're describing there is that man's neighbor was whoever he encountered in the moment. Right. Right. Whoever had the neighbors. We are all neighbors. At the end of the day, we're yeah, all neighbors. we're all neighbors. Yeah. We just haven't figured it out yet. Because someone has right. told us to hate your neighbor. <laughs> someone has told yeah. you your neighbor is dangerous, that you're dangerous. It's not, your, your neighbor's not like you. Yeah, or going back to what you were originally saying about the suit. Like, I've got some things that I automatically discount. Like, a man in a suit is a punk. And I'm not going to be able to receive anything from him. Mm-hmm. Or, right. you know, maybe the color of your skin or whatever, whatever thing you put on there, you can't receive the life that is within that person. You don't right. give them that dignity. You can't see their light. So oh, a woman said that to me the other day on Facebook. She said, once you put that first sentence in there, I couldn't hear anything else you said after that. So I told you I didn't care about that one thing. And suddenly you didn't hear anything else I said after that. Wow. I'm looking right. for a reason to separate myself from you and your thoughts. That's, I mean, that's literally how, how, how sad it's gotten. 
or, or I'll say it's always been. Yeah, it's, it's, really it's really bad now because you know, people, not only are they not really thinking for themselves, they have like five bullet points. And if you don't go along with every one of them, you're X'd, you're canceled. (laughs) I'm canceling that because you didn't believe my bullet points in life. Really? Yes. That's what's really scary. And the division is getting, we're getting further away from each other. I'm the convener for the Great Panthers of Texas. Great Great Panthers? Yeah. Okay. What is A neutral color. It's a neutral color. Oh, okay. Right. So... A lot of people think of gray being old. I said, here's the problem. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, you're, you guys are the old, you're old, you're the old black panther said. No, that's not what this is about. You're, you're the gray we're, panthers. Jesus. You were the black panthers back, right. back it's in not the your, day, Richard. We're lo- long yeah. in the tooth and, and it's all it's all colored now. But no. Okay, I, wait. Yeah. What's yeah. the gray panthers? <laughs> the gray panthers are intergenerational advocacy group. And right now we're focusing on things like the issues that are happening in nursing homes, especially with COVID but also student loans, because all of this is going to affect us some way, shape, or form, and we haven't seen the intersectionality of it all. So mm-hmm. one of the issues I have right now is people not recognizing, again, as soon as I say Great Panthers, they instantly put it into a box. I said, the problem you have with me is I can't be boxed. Well, I'm not a boxed individual. And no one else should be a boxed individual. You've allowed yourself to be put in a box, you've, and you've allowed yourself to play into that box. That's the problem. If someone has 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 deemed you to be X, Y, or Z, and you're trying to live down to X, Y, and Z rather than finding the best you there is, that's the problem. And I said, dude, I, when I'm in a classroom, and I I, I know the, the day my father, uh, the week my father passed, and I was in a, I I gave the class that week. As far, I did the class the, the week my father passed, and trust me, it was probably the most difficult class I've ever done. But I'm in front of a class of kids in the, in the lunchroom, as a matter of fact. There was probably 60 kids in there at a time. And while I'm talking about my father passing, how it made me feel, and I, I was talking about the pain I felt and what it felt like to try to have to live up to being a man when everybody's depending on you and you're the one who's literally crumbling in the room. Mm. And while I'm crying, two of the young men who've been with me for three years at that point were in the corner laughing. I'm, I'm, I'm bothered by this. Yeah. I said, while I'm in this extreme pain, you can see me in tears. While I'm standing here in extreme pain, I see you laughing while I'm in pain. Let me make you understand how this goes down with me. I think, I don't know what you're laughing at, but I think you're laughing at me while I'm in pain. And that launched me into another thing about how we deal with things that make us feel uncomfortable. Because the reason they were laughing was because they were both uncomfortable in my pain. They didn't want to be with me. They didn't want to be with me in that moment because it would have made them feel like they were also in pain. And it would have made them start relating to the things they were hurting behind. That's vulnerability. And that's something that they want to avoid at all costs. At all costs. The funny part is, once that session was ended, and I, and I talked about, you know, how we deal with pain, and how the fact that we, you know, we, we drink ourselves into it, and we drug ourselves, we, you know, we hurt other people. We, I said, but here's the funny part. When we finished that session, young men were lined up to tell me about their pain. Right at that very moment. Our problem as a society is not realizing what we're losing. I think there is a a crisis of mature masculinity and, you know, you being in pain in front of these kids, they don't know how to be men because nobody's showing them. So they go out and do the best they can. They think by controlling somebody or something or causing fear or, but I mean, this work that you're doing, taking yourself in there and showing them an example of a mature man is exactly the way they used to do it in ancient times. I mean, it's a, initiation. It's I'm showing you, I'm telling you the secrets of manhood. So, I mean, your work is so important. And, and it ain't easy. It will take the, it will take the life out of you. You got to have big shoulders to have a young lady tell yeah. you every day I go home and I'm, I'm I don't know if I'm going to be raped or not. Today. Oh, yeah. When, I remember at that time you brought, you had asked them to do some kind of art project. What did they just wrote like a sentence or two and mm-hmm maybe drew a picture 
but it was page after page after page of the most horrific mm-hmm. things that these kids oh, yeah. were saying about their reality. Oh yeah. And um, that's, I, I, I that's, call it screaming from the edge of, of Austin. It's screaming. Well, we're out here in, in the, in the outer, outer banks of Dell Valley, which is the outskirts of Austin. And I said, we're screaming from the edge of, of Austin because of the poverty and the problems it creates. And I just asked the kids to write down how they want to be remembered and, and write down something that no one would know about them, but someone should. Something no one would know. That was it. I said, I'll keep this to myself. But kids said, I don't care. I don't care. I, people need to know. I said, but they were writing down some things that at the end of the day, I went in the, in the principal's office and cried. Yeah, it, it was, was horrific. You know, every one of them had a story of something that was out, outrageous, outlandishly outrageous. And I'm just, I'm just, oh my God. And the superintendent of the schools walked in while I was in the principal's office crying. Mm. I said, you've got, you've got to, I don't, I, I thought, and here's the thing. I had been doing this at 14 years at that point. I said, and I thought I knew, I thought I had seen, I thought I'd heard until it all came at the same time. And then I realized this community I'm dealing with is full of trauma and pain. Yeah. And no one knows it because they're all walking around with a bag full of it and, and it's never open mm-hmm. until it opens up and, and then it gets loose on everybody. I said, do you want to know why you have fights in the hallway? That kid's not fighting that other kid. Oh, that, yeah. that kid's fighting a demon they brought with them to school today. You it's had mentioned up. earlier the power of being witnessed when you talked about the kind of roughneck boys getting together with the more nerdy boys. And once mm-hmm. they sat in the room together and heard each other's stories, they realized they had a lot more in common than they thought. And oh, yeah. that's the power of witnessing. And the same thing with this girl and allowing these kids to tell their secrets. I mean, it comes at a heavy cost to you, but. Oh, it, it, well, here's the other thing. Hopefully, hopefully, when big, biggest hope you can imagine right now that uh, Tesla's talking about put, putting the Gigafactory literally a quarter of a mile away from my house as, as the crow flies. Yeah. What do you envision this doing for your community? What would something like this do for, because wait, before you answer that, I want to say I've sat with you forever and you're talking about, we don't have a grocery store. We don't have medical. Everybody in our community has to drive away on a not so great road. That's kind of overcrowded and narrow to get the services that they need. And I know that you've been advocating for that for a while. So what do you see I mean, besides the obvious advantages, what are you oh, seeing as yeah. a vision? It's, it's been upwards of, tw- Angela, it's been upwards of 20 years that have been fighting for a major grocery store to, to yeah. deal with food insecurities. It's been forever trying to get a health care facility in our, in our neighborhood. And, and the area I'm talking about is 172 square miles uh, with not one health care facility that's open 24 hours a day or seven days a week or uh, a full day of any day. We, we have one that's in our neighborhood that's a trailer now. And that was only after a lawsuit was filed. It's a, literally a trailer and it's open three days a week for eight hours at a time. And as soon as COVID hit, they closed it. And, and the zip code that I live in is, is number one in Travis County, which is one of the hot spots in the country right now. We're number one in that in that hot spot. And we don't have a health care facility. Um, that's at the end of the day, that's how, how, how we are being addressed. When you talk about what poverty creates, poverty creates these other problems that no one talks about. Poverty creates the fact that you have no voice. So we don't have a healthy, we don't have a major grocery store. You don't have the healthcare facility. You have terrible infrastructure. You don't have infrastructure to be able to start businesses of your own. I want to go out and start my own business. We have no place to even put it. So we're hoping that with this Tesla factory, which will be the largest one in North America, by the way, uh, will bring the spotlight, the pro, increase the profile of this area in a way. And we already know that it has because everybody's involved. Everybody wants to have their two cent worth. We only have um, just a couple of minutes left. I wanted to ask you just your kind of in a nutshell idea about, because I haven't talked to you in a while since of COVID. Mm-hmm. I mean, what do you think about like what's going on right now? Oh, what, what, I, I think what is going on right now with respect to politics and virus. Oh, like the, the and whole Black Lives Matter thing. Is, and, 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 and all that. All that is all emblematic of the problems America has always been facing. And never, and never actually want to articulate. It's now having to be articulated where everybody can see. And it happened at all the proper time. It was a proper storm. And here's the funny part. We weathered the storm. And you did Black Lives Matter. And you're out in the streets. 
but nobody said, what is the outcome we're looking for? What is outcome oriented? What do you want to change based on what's happening now? How do we get to the utopia that you think that everybody wants to live? How do you live the great American dream when so many people have been left out? How do we get there? Without that unifying vision, the people perish. The movement oh. perishes. And there's and we no leadership. right back to where we right. were. There's no leadership. So I think this gets back, this circles right back to our point before. We, the people, united, have so much power, and we could actually make a difference. Thank you for your time, <laughs> and thank you for your perspective. Yeah. yeah. I, th- I appreciate your, all your work, too, Richard. Thank you for, for being on the front line. Uh, thank you. So, all right. I'll talk to you soon, hopefully, okay. maybe in person all <laughs> before right. too long. All righty. Bye. Take care.